They're giving me the thumbs up that it's uh, time for us to begin. We want to welcome each and every one of you here tonight. Let's go over some family announcements, have a prayer or two, introduce our speaker. We'll sing a song together, then we'll hand things over to him. So here's some uh, family updates. Number one, Carol Snell is in Hutchinson Regional Medical Center, room 4105. He has been uh, diagnosed with congestive heart failure. He'll be on meds and, um, and is doing rehab but he's doing much better than he was on Sunday. And I was talking to George Batchelor just a little bit ago. Now he could get a phone call or a text, but let's do that in the evening. He's very busy with his rehab. George? Very often, four o'clock on Saturday. All right, so daughter Mary said that he would like to see those calls and encouragements and staying in touch with them. But yeah, you really can't visit. Only family can go or you know, a minister can go visit as well. All right, uh, we had announced earlier in the week uh, that uh, Joan Thrash was having some health issues. She got checked out on several different things and found out it was primarily dehydration, and uh, she's doing better from that, but does appreciate the prayers. Uh, baby uh, Bryson Villarreal that we've been praying for continues to improve, so we're so thankful for that. George and Mary Baxter uh, also wanted us to be praying for their great-granddaughter, um, Alira uh, Winger, who is only six months old. Illyria, actually. Illyria is gonna be undergoing eye surgery to correct the pressure in her eye next week at Kansas City Children's Mercy Hospital. Again, she's just six months old, so let's remember Illyria in our prayers. BBS poster concert, uh, contest has begun. I was noticing some of the artwork on the wall over here on the north wall, so yes. We have that coming up in about a week and a half, so we can, uh, do that, but it says the, the contest has begun. Pick up your poster board from the front of the auditorium, return your finished poster to the supply room. So it must be right up here then. Uh, ah, you can also pre register your kids uh, for Vacation Bible School. Where's Alan? Where is that? Is Alan here with us? Alan every year makes up a poster. Have you got your poster going yet, brother? Hey, yes. All right. I thought, boy, our kindergartners are very talented around here, you know? That was Mr. Allen that did that. So he, he's given us a good challenge to meet that. All right, we do have VBS schedule uh, for the last Saturday in June. Uh, we're needing some pop-up canopies. Um, lots of volunteers are needed to sign up by the nursery. Contact Laura Lee Rollins or Jessica Wassinger if you have any questions. Now here is a real need that uh, we want you to consider, or maybe you can recommend somebody for this. We are in need of additional audiovisual operators for Sunday and Wednesday. We need to get Mr. Trey some help on this. If you have any interest in learning this vital service, please contact the office or visit with uh, Trey or myself, or just kind of let one of the elders know to say, hey, I'd like to start learning that. Especially on Wednesday night, it's very, very simple. A little more complex on Sunday, but we'd like to train some people for that. Uh, Wednesday morning ladies Bible class will begin in September. They're using the book Immeasurably More by Cassandra Martin. Let the office know if you plan to attend and need a book. Cost is around $16. Donations are being accepted to help provide this book for the ladies in class. Please give your donations to the office. And also next Wednesday night, um, it's a fourth Wednesday and we kind of planned as a staff to try to do something once a month, uh, kind of the end of the month. This is a five Wednesday month. But uh, if you'd like to come a little bit early, say from 6.15 to 6.45, there may be some uh, ice cream sundaes available for you for a little fellowship before we get together for our midweek service. So that will be next Wednesday. We wanted to give you a heads up on that. All right, now from our speaker last week, 
uh, he left an outline. He said he'd make a, have us make a photocopy. So if you'd like some of Gary Witcher's material from The Fruit on the Spirit, we'll have that up here in the front. Also, some of you wanted some additional schedules of the wonderful speakers that we've, uh, that have come and been with us or we're looking forward to having um, in the upcoming weeks. Uh, here's additional copies of that. Right up here on the front. Now let me go ahead and introduce our speaker for this evening. We are blessed to have Brother Carl Farrell come our way. Now, we had another speaker that had to back out at the last second because of a family issue that came up. And so I, I thought, well, who's a wonderful speaker we could get? And Brother Carl came to mind. And, uh, and he has with him his lovely wife, Janet, uh, with uh, him here tonight. Of course, Carl, for how many years at St. John, Carl? 26? That's what I was thinking. It was about 26 years. He was a, a preacher for the Church of Christ in St. John. Many, many, many years as a counselor here um, at Eastwood on Tuesday nights, I think he used to do that. So we know Carl quite well. And then he retired just a little uh, while ago. And here's kind of just a little brief bio of what Carl's been up to since his retirement. He said, Janet and I spent 18 months on the road encouraging families in ministry before COVID-19 prompted our purchase of a permanent home in St. John. Now we spend half our time on the road. We're going to be returning to South Dakota in July before coming back to St. John in the fall. Winter will be in Texas again. Beyond that, we don't plan. Isn't that the joy of retirement, you know? But we are blessed to have Carl with us. Again, we're going to keep the topic on the Holy Spirit. He's also going to introduce how the Holy Spirit and the Scripture work together, together as well as story. So Holy Spirit, Scripture, and story will be his topic this evening. Now, our song leader uh, texted me shortly before services and said, hey, I am not feeling too whippy. So I said, well, you tell me what you were singing, we'll try to do it. So we're going to sing Faith is a Victory, and then we'll have a prayer, and then we'll hand things over to Brother Carl. Let's do all three verses. Faith is a Victory. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall build the glowing skies. Against the foe and bills below, let all our strength be heard. Faith is a victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. the world. His banner over us is love, the sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like a world when breath swept on our every field. The faith by which they conquer death is still our shining shield. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of life, our hearts with love aflame. Will vanquish all the host of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to gather together for this midweek service. Father, we appreciate every single person that's been able to be here with us tonight, as well as those that have joined us online. We appreciate the technology you bless us with, people like Trey that's able to serve in this area. But Father, as we have mentioned, we have many on our prayer requests that's on our minds and on our hearts, and we want to bring before you here tonight. For our dear brother Carol Snell, Father, we 
Thank you, they have been able to diagnose what is ailing him at this time, but we are praying for healing and restoration, Father, so that he could uh, resume his activities and be able to be with us once again. Father, for our sister Joan Thrash, we appreciate so much the news that we were able to hear that she wasn't suffering anything that couldn't be easily treated with this dehydration. Father, for baby Bryson Villarreal, and we pray for his continued um, healing, restoration, be with those young parents as they are up there in the hospital supporting him through all of uh, these challenging times that they've been facing. Father, for George and Mary's uh, great-granddaughter, we're praying in advance for her upcoming surgery on her eye at such a young and precious age. Just pray that that would go so very well for her and that she would not have any lingering or lasting issues with that. Lord, we're so thankful for the young people you have blessed us with in our congregations and those that we have associations with. And we're asking for your hand to be upon all of those that are going to be involved with our Vacation Bible School. Praying for the workers, those that will be volunteering and serving. We're praying that many young people will be uh, uh, impressed in a very positive way um, as we talk about Daniel and courage and faith. And so, Father, we just pray for open doors with that upcoming ministry. Lord, we're so thankful for this Wednesday night service where we're able to come together and hear wonderful speakers. We, we appreciate so much that Brother Carl could be with us with his wife Janet here tonight. They've served faithful in your kingdom for many, many years. And Father, we are so indebted and appreciate uh, Carl and his many years of, of working here with the Eastwood Congregation and those in this community. Father, we look forward to with eager uh, ears and eager hearts uh, to learn this message about your Holy Spirit and how he works through the word and, and this wonderful story of salvation that you have blessed us with. Father, be with them here tonight. Be with us as listeners, and may we be an encouragement to him and to Janet as well. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, Carl. Well, it's good to see you. I think I know most of you, uh, but you seem substantially older than last time I was here. Um, <laughs> That may not be true, but I, on the other hand, have not aged at all. Or at least my wife said I haven't grown up any. <laughs> Trying to figure out how we talk about um, how God communicates his message to us is something that uh, I think we presume a lot about. Uh, the Hebrew writer says God spoke to the fathers and the prophets in lots of portions and lots of ways. But now in these last days has spoken unto us in his son, who is the exact representation of the nature of God. So when Jesus comes, he's just the way that God is. But John says that when Jesus came to his own, his own did not receive him. Now, if everybody that believed that they were following God saw Jesus and didn't recognize him as God, and he's the exact representation of the nature of God, what do we know about those folks who thought they knew the scriptures so well? that somehow it wasn't making a connection. And before we get too harsh with them, we need to continue to ask ourselves this question of, have we missed something? Is there something that maybe we've not uh, considered or not reflected on appropriately? Now, before we go too far into this, and. I'm going to work the clicker until it either does something or my button falls off. All right. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul is writing to Timothy the evangelist who he has left at Ephesus to put things in order. And one of the first cautions that Paul gives Timothy is about scripture. 
He says, this is my charge to you, just as it was when I went to Macedonia, that you would stay in Ephesus so that you can tell the relevant people not to teach anything different or to cling on to myths and endless genealogies. That sort of thing breeds disputes rather than the instruction in faith that comes from God. The goal of the instruction of faith is love. Love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. What God is trying to produce in you is this sincere love. And if what is produced in you is something different than that, then you're missing something. Uh, I always love group participation. So here's group participation. How many of you had siblings? How many of you had siblings that were a little ornery? Uh, I was the only sane one in my whole family. Uh, it was, uh, my siblings and I are Irish twins. We're 10 months apart. Just one right after another, after another, after another. Until my mom said, we're never going to have a daughter, forget it. We're done. And so they stopped. And, you know, one of the problems was I started, I was 10 pounds and seven ounces, I think is what they said. And Fred was the last one. Fred was 12 pounds even and 24 inches long. And mom said, I think I'm done. <laughs> uh, but Fred became a caricature in my ministry. I've always told stories about my siblings. And I usually use Fred as the token sibling. He's referred to in my stories as my dumb old brother Fred. And my Fred would fight about anything. If you said, isn't the sky blue, Fred would say it looks aquamarine to me. You know, you'd, Fred would... You'd say, isn't that a nice dog? He said, it's not really a dog. It's, it's one of those dachshunds. So he was always trying to find a way to get into conflict with you. And there's no one that is any more enjoyable to get into conflict with than your siblings. And we're really good at it. Um, most of us would tell stories about our siblings if we were speaking the facts that would embarrass us if anyone, if it was told about anyone else. We'd just think that's, that's atrocious. Nobody acts that way. But we did. And the stories, though, that we tell might... I have a grandnephew who's four. And he says, each time we go to Texas, he says, Uncle Carl, tell me a story about the four little brothers. Well, that's the story of me and my brothers and his grandpa. And he likes to hear the stories. And those stories are really easy. There's the really intelligent, good-looking older brother. <laughs> and then the other brothers. Uh, but we'll tell those stories, and sometimes the stories will be things that have happened. I, I've told some of them here. Have I told you about shooting my brother Steve out of the slingshot? And trying to send him into orbit, <laughs> made out of car inner tubes between two big elm trees. We drug him back, and when we turned him loose, he was little, but he was holding his knees, and I stepped on his foot. And so he shot out four and a half feet. 
He was only four foot tall. Dislocated his ankle, he was on crutches for three or four months. Um, I saved his life because I'm not sure he'd have cleared the barbed wire fence. Uh, so, so, you know, you have those stories. Well, you know, my nephew, he goes, yeah, tell, tell me them stories. And my brother, my dumb old brother Fred is the only brother I have who's deceased, but I buried him twice. Once we were out behind the house and he was up in the real high in an elm tree. I picked up a dirt clod, threw it as high as I could up where the eagles fear to fly. And it would hit the branches of the tree and blow up. And we thought it was bombs and we thought it was fun. And I hit him in the side of the head and knocked him out of the tree. <laughs> boom, 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 coming gently descending through the branches. And he landed in a heap, knocked out cold. I was nine, I think, and I thought I killed him. So I drug him behind the chicken house and I put a piece of roofing tin over the top of him until I could figure out how to tell mom, because I was pretty sure I was going to get a beating for this one. Okay? So we have lots of stories. Now, here's the thing about those stories. I could see you in three months and you would be able to give me the general details of both of those stories. You may not be able to say, oh, his name was Steve and he was in a slingshot and shot out through the trees. You may not be able to say Steve, but you had a brother you shot out of a slingshot. You'll remember that. If I say I had a brother that I buried twice, you'll say the guy that fell out of the tree. The second time I did his funeral, okay, and so it was a sure enough burial, and he's not coming back from that one. But uh, stories are things that we hang on to, and it makes it easy for us to remember things. Um, if I ask you facts from the Bible, you may be able to give me certain facts, but I will guarantee that most of them are related to stories. There was a fellow who ended up in a lion's den. You remember his name? Yeah, that guy up there, Daniel. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a um, man who kept having dreams, and in the dreams he was always the good-looking, smarter brother. Remember him? Joseph. He got thrown into a pit. Uh, we, we can go through and look at these stories, and the stories remind us of facts. But they're supposed to remind us of something in particular. And when you use Scripture in such a way that all you do is you get caught up in disputes about genealogies and about myths, then you're missing it. The use of Scripture is to produce in you faith, and that faith is to produce in you love for the people of God. And if it doesn't produce that, go read the story again, because you didn't get it right. Let's see if we can go on. Chapter 4 of 1 Timothy. He tells Timothy, Until I come, I want you to give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to teaching. Do not neglect the gift that's in you, which is given to you through prophecy, when the elders laid hands on you. Work hard at these things. Give yourself to them so that other, everyone may see your progress. Pay attention to yourself and to your teaching. Keep steadily on with them. If you do that, you see, you'll save yourself and you'll save those who hear you. Do you realize 
that we're very different from Christians in the first century times. You read your own Bible. They didn't. How long was it before the average Christian had their own copy of scriptures? How many years? Hmm? 16 centuries. Okay. So it's, it's a long time of not having a Bible to read, right? So how did they get the information? The stories were told to them. And they rehearsed the stories every Sabbath day when they got together. And, and parents told the stories around the table. And all of the kids listened. And they went, we know that story. That's a good one. The, Paul is telling Timothy, and the reality is this giving attention to reading of scripture probably is taking place in the synagogue because most of them wouldn't have a copy of scripture. Wouldn't have a, a copy of even a portion of scripture. The only one we know of in the New Testament that has their copy of a portion of scripture was Ethiopian eunuch and he was well healed. He was a rich guy and he only had a portion of the book of Isaiah. So public reading of scripture was important because that's how you got the facts out. The other way we get information out to people is we present it to them in songs. If I give you a verse of a song, you'll be able to give me the next verse. Just as I am without one plea. Okay? Uh, uh, we'll do a silly one. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. Don't let the devil. Well, okay. We, we know all those stories because they've come to us in the songs. Well, the book of Psalms is the song book of the early Christians. And they sang those things. They had tunes for them. We don't know what it was. But they sang them and they were familiar with those songs. But we can do some things. Uh, uh, how many times at some funeral have you ha heard someone say, uh, recite the 23rd Psalm with me? And are you able to recite it with them? And when did you sit down and memorize it? You don't even remember memorizing it. You've just heard it often enough that you know it. Okay? We, we learn these things. Now, Scripture is important. But if you misuse Scripture, if you're not... If you're not doing what God intends with it, if you don't end up with the right result, then you're missing out on things. And the Holy Spirit is that entity, that being of God. Now, I pressed that and it hiccuped. Oh, hang on. I, I, I went too far ahead again. There we go. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I got way more scripture than we're going to get to today, all right? Because it's too hard to push these buttons. Um, it says, You, on the other hand, stand firm on the things that you learned and believed, knowing it was, uh, knowing who it was that you received them from, and how from childhood. You have known the holy writings that have the power to make you wise for salvation through faith in King Jesus. All scripture is breathed by God and is useful for teaching, for rebuke, for improvement, for training in righteousness, so that people who belong to God may be complete, fitted out, and ready for every good work. What scripture is he talking about being inspired? 
Well, we, we say all scripture, but the reality, what he had in mind was the Old Testament. Okay, I mean, he wasn't thinking about New Testament writings at, at this time. But these things are there so that we'll be able to do what we need to do. And we can trust them. How do we know we can trust them? Notice the way this is phrased. He says, stand firm in the things that you learned and believe. You know who you receive them from. See, the testimony of the one that delivered the message, in this case, grandmother and mother, was strong enough that he said, you can put credibility behind this. You can, you can guarantee and ensure this because you know these people and you know they wouldn't be lying to you. Um, the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 4 is, is talking about uh, a play on words in Scripture. He says, So then let us make every effort to enter that rest so that no one should trip and fall through the same pattern of unbelief. God's word, now notice, notice what it's saying about what God's word is. God's word is alive, you see. It's powerful. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It can pierce right in between soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It can go straight to the point of what the human heart is thinking or intending to do. No creature remains hidden before God. All are naked, laid bare before the eyes of the one uh, whom we must present an account. When it says that the word of God here is sharper than any double-edged sword, it's not talking about the text. It's not talking about what you hold in your hand. It's talking about the word who became flesh. That word of God gets it. And it sees to it that you get it. And so our confidence is in something that moves beyond simply what is written on a piece of paper before us. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to minimize scripture. Please don't hear me saying that. I think scripture is really, really important. But we have to be careful with scripture. There's some who really, really have messed it up. Let's, let's look at one case in point. And it comes out of, oh, I went too far. There we go. Matthew chapter 22. There's a story here of a group of guys who were real serious about the scripture. They and their buddies. They're, they're completely serious about Scripture. And they think they have it figured out. In fact, they make up stories to prove that they're right and the other guy's wrong. And these are just stories that they make up. The same day some Sadducees came to him. The Sadducees denied the resurrection. And their question was this. Let me tell you a story, teacher. There was this guy, and he got married, and he died, and he didn't have any kids. So according to the law, his widow married his brother, and they didn't have any kids. So according to the law, the widow married another brother, and they didn't have any kids. And this went on and on and on until they ran out of brothers. And finally, the widow died. And when she gets to heaven, whose wife is she? Because all of them had her. And under their breath, they said, and I guess that proves there's no resurrection. See, this story that they had created, this, this case in point, was the thing that they used to, uh, to nail people who believed different than them and prove that their understanding of Scripture was better than anybody else's. 
And Jesus said, well, you have made a mistake. Because you don't know your Bible, and you don't know God's power. Now, if you're going to miss two things in, in all of your walk of faith, not knowing what the Bible says and not knowing how powerful God is, those are the bad two things to miss. Okay, that's, that's you've missed it really big. It says you don't know what the scriptures are saying and you don't understand the power of this God that we serve. In the resurrection, you see, people don't marry or get married off. They're like angels in heaven. But as for the resurrection of the dead, did you never read what was said to you by God in these words? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And we know that God isn't the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, when those... When the scripture was written, when that phrase was written, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Was God trying to prove that he was the God of the living? Or is Jesus just taking that text and says, think this through. Ponder this. Do you think God's talking about people in the past who no longer count? Or do you think he's talking about people who are still meaningful? Which do you believe? Well, they messed up, and they walked away with their heads shaken, and they were, they were defeated and beaten. However, when the Pharisees heard it, They're the other group in town. They got all excited. So boy, he set them on their heels. Let's see what he can do with our story. Now, here's our story. They said, teacher, what's the most com important commandment in the law? Now, That may seem like a real important question. In fact, on the face of it, it looks pretty good. But in reality, the way they use it makes it not a good question at all. Jesus said, well, you have to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your life, and with all of your mind. This is the first commandment, and it's the one that really matters. And the second is similar to it, and it's this. You'll love your neighbor as yourself, and the entire law hangs on these two commandments. And that goes for the prophets, too. All of Scripture hangs on these two principles. Now, does that mean that none of the rest of the Bible is important except loving the Lord and loving your neighbor? Jesus says that's what all the rest of it was talking about. I mean, th this, is, this is it. This is what you do. Well, what about wrangling over whether you can do good to someone or bad on the Sabbath. See, Jesus had to bring them back on that one one time as well. Because they thought that Scripture was rules, that it was a regulation to limit and restrict behavior. And that's not what it is. It is the path through which you come to love God and you come to love your neighbor. And it's things that demonstrate your love for who they are. 
You will not lie to your neighbor because that doesn't bring about their love for you and your love for them. You won't take their spouse because that doesn't produce this love that we have for each other. We follow God and we do the things of God because all that we are, we want to be um, tribute to him. We want it to be uh, our, our purpose. And the scripture tells us that our prayers as they move up before God are like sweet, it's, it's like the aroma of incense. Have you ever walked into a room and you, you hit a smell that is just really familiar to you and immediately you're taken somewhere else? Okay? For me, it's pickle juice. Okay, now everybody's got their own. I can have pickle juice if I want it. It's pickle juice because the first time I ever remember throwing up in my life, my grandmother was canning pickles. And I got violently ill. And when I, sell, when I smell pickle juice, I don't go, oh, yes. <laughs> I, I get that tickle in the back of my throat. Okay, and an oh no. Well, you may have something else. Uh, for my wife, for years, it was brute cologne. Now, when Janet and I first started dating, I didn't normally wear cologne, but I was going on a date, so I put on some brute cologne. And Janet says, boy, that smells good. And I thought, boy, she must really like your stuff. So I've been slathering up with it ever since. Well, somebody, probably Maureen Harrison, gave me some Avon cologne one year at Christmas. It came in a little car. And, uh, and I put some of that on. Janet says, boy, that smells good. I really like that. And I thought, well, now I know you like Brute better. She said, Brute? Well, you said that one time. I didn't know what it was. I was trying to come up with something to say. Okay, I mean, you know, it, it didn't make any difference. But you get this scent, and suddenly you think of things. Uh, maybe for you it's the smell of homemade cookies. Or for you it might be the... the uh, tell you how bad I am. For me, it was the aroma of a branding fire because it meant that you were, the smell of burning hair meant that the calf crop was coming in and you were about to make money. So that, you know, that's a, a pretty good deal. Everybody has their own thing. For God, it's our prayers. And when we don't even have the words, he provides for us the spirit who gives the words to the things that we can't say. In fact, when your prayers are reduced, and maybe this hasn't happened to you very many times in your life, but when your prayers are reduced to simply groaning, you're out of things to say, and it's just horrible, and you just pour your heart, out, your heart out before God. God says what he means is this, and he gives the words to it. The Spirit is the helper who takes care of us and, and gives us the things that we're looking for. The problem with these two groups of people in, in Matthew 22 is they made a shift. They went from trusting God who made the promises to trusting their understanding, and it was a misunderstanding, of the promises. 
and their misunderstanding became more important to them than the God who made the promises. Do you know that that uh, I was I read this many many years ago and I can't find it anymore. So I hope it was true. Uh, there was a tradition that if the Jews, if one of them accidentally got sent to hell, that Abraham stood at the gates of hell to turn back anyone God made a mistake about. Because they trust Abraham. And Abraham's not going to let any Jew go to hell. Now, that's an illustration of trusting your understanding about things more than you're trusting God who made the promise. And, and we don't want to fall prey to that. It is all about the story. Most Christians never had a copy of the text for the first century, or the first 15 centuries. But what they had was the story. If I asked my nephew about the story of the four little brothers, he'd say, well, there was one strong, real good looking one and the three other brothers. Now, he wouldn't be able to give you very many details, but he could give you that because he gets that about the story. Now, he's not put together that his grandpa is one of the three other brothers, but he, he understands something of the story. Not the detail, but the gist. Okay? The, the, the essence of the story. Um, what these people had was the Spirit of God who empowered them as they listened to the story, trusting that Spirit to communicate to them about the God that they loved. And they just they intrinsically believed that this was going to be the thing that sustained them. And sometimes we get way too caught up in minutia, in the little bitty details that really don't mean a whole lot. I mean, if, if you can sort the sons of Jacob by their birth mother, good on you. But I don't care. It, it doesn't matter to me which one belonged to who. Okay? That, that's a detail that's true about Scripture. It's, it's a fact but it doesn't matter. But what ought I to learn about the story of Jacob or Israel? Well, I ought to learn that God takes care of his people and he goes to all kinds of gymnastics to make sure that they, in spite of their hard-headedness, in spite of their bowed neck, are embraced by him. See, that's what we want to get from the story. And when you read the story simply for the details, you're missing the point. God's Spirit is that thing that says, uh, Jesus is for us, not against us. That Jesus loves me. He's not looking to do me in. When my wife was a little girl going to church, um, there was a song that was sung. But I can't think of the name. 
of it to save my life. Uh, anybody ever remember the song, There's an All-Seeing Eye Watching You? I didn't go to church when I was a little kid, so I never learned that song. But in this song, what my wife assumed is that there was no escape from this all-seeing eye, and whenever you did something bad, it was going to get you. But that's not what the song was about. There's no place that you can go. There's no darkness that you can get to that God can't see and take care of you. But see, you can have the same phrase and twist the understanding of it and totally, you know, that was a song. That she, she said that, you know, she just used to be fearful when they sang this song. Like, man, I mean, she's a bad little girl. And, uh, <laughs> and she knew there was no way she could get away from this all-seeing eye. But what the song was saying was something totally different than what she was understanding. I don't know how many times we have misunderstood as badly as the Sadducees who were trying to figure out whose wife was who, or the Pharisees that were trying to figure out which law they could set aside and not have to spend so much time on and which ones they really, really had to get. The point of Scripture is that there is no final exam in heaven. You don't have to get a 75% in your Bible knowledge to go to heaven. You just have to love God. And you have to love the brothers. Because that's the greatest of the commandments. Now, does that mean that we get a pass on everything else? No, if you go out and start murdering people, we're going to have a problem with you. Okay, we're not giving you a pass on everything. But understand what the priority is. And the priority is that you love God and you love your brothers. And when you do those things, you're the people God has called you to be. And when you fail, it doesn't really matter how much scripture you know. All right, I'm out of soap. So we're going to a time of prayer. Some, somebody in charge of that? It's not me, right? <laughs> that tonight. <laughs> That's sweet of you all there. We do appreciate Carl and Janet for uh, being here with us tonight and appreciate him stepping up kind of in, in a pinch and helping us out uh, to come and share the, the story about scripture and, and the role of the Holy Spirit. And hey, that matches our theme, doesn't it? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love people, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, did you come down here early and kind of scalp yeah. that up? Okay, I figured. I, I knew Carl on up. Hey, last week, uh, I like how we kind of ended our service as we uh, focused on uh, thanking our, our speakers and it reminded them that we love them. And so, let's sing together, We Love You with the Love of the Lord. We love you with the love of the Lord. We love you with the love of the Lord. We see in you the glory of our King. And we love you with the love of the Lord. And we do. Thank you for coming our way. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. We want to thank all those who have been watching online as well. We are dismissed.